it's so cold, we're going to go right on through this thing when we get back in there where it's warm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that ain't going to happen today. <laughs> no. I got to switch this thing. I got it. That's good. No, I was just bending it down a little bit. Not having to uh, board today, sort of a little bit different, but let's pray. Lord, I thank you for every person and family and especially kids and different ones, Lord, that are here today to, uh, to thank you, to praise you, to just really maybe get a grasp of what you really did for us. Lord, it's uh, getting hidden more every day in the world. But, Lord, in our hearts, we know it's real. Lord, help us as we uh, just go through this message today, Lord, to receive exactly what you have for us, Lord. Let us take it to heart. Let us realize that you can't hide Jesus. Lord, let us know that if we're hiding, there's something going on in us that's not right. Be with us now as we read your word, Lord. Go before us. Touch each and every one right where they need a point today, Lord, and bless them for coming. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, I, I, I was reading, I'm reading a lot of Old Testament now, so normally when I get up here, like each, when I've done a sunrise service, I only just talk about Jesus rising, you know, and everybody talks about that. But I've been thinking about why so many people go to church so many people I talk to uh, say they might go to sunrise service. A lot of people go to church four times a year. A lot of people go to church just every now and then. A lot of people might not go to church, but they say they're believers. You know, everybody's a believer if you come out front and ask them just about it. Very seldom somebody say, no, I don't believe. Very seldom. And it just sort of, I just started looking back, and I was wondering why, why uh, so many people go to church, but they don't really understand like Easter Sunday morning. Why? What's the big deal about if it's not a big deal to them, then something ain't real. You know, if it ain't a big deal that he came to earth and died, it ain't real. You know, and I was sitting there thinking to myself, and I went back and I looked at, in the story of Adam and Eve, you know, God told Adam to not eat from the tree, and he told, he didn't tell him in the Bible, don't say what it said, go to Eve, because Eve wasn't created yet when he told Adam. But after he created her, Adam's job was to make sure she look after her and take care of her. And I just sort of, it started at the beginning. But, you know, Adam didn't understand sin. There wasn't no sin. He wasn't prepared for what Satan was going to do. He could have been if he had trusted God and talked to God and did what he was supposed to, the connection he had walking with him in the garden. But it seems like when he put the woman in his life, she might have took some of the walking away. She might have started just spending time with her a little more than God as much. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know, but I know some reason along the line he didn't explain to her correctly about sin and what was going to happen because she bit the apple. Then he fall and bit it too. Well, I say apple all the time, but I don't know what fruit it was. But the whole thing is we're prepared. There's nowhere in Scripture. You know, as I go through Scripture, I see all kind of things where God did unbelievable things he destroyed the same god we serve today is the one that destroyed the whole world he, i mean he destroyed the whole world everything but eight people because of one man not because of eight people but because of one man and he's the same one we serve in today but we don't think about him like that we think about him was you know he's mercy and grace and he loves us so much he, you know he would never do that what would he not do He does everything he says he's going to do. My, my title today was Promises. You know, we're here today because of his promise. And it started from day one. It started before the creation of the world, you know. And so as, as I'm going through that, it said he put a rainbow, you know, in the sky because he would never flood the earth again. Does everybody understand he'll never flood the earth again? There's any question about that. There's no question about that to, to a believer, right? But he said he put it there so he would remember when he sees it, right? Who do you think is really remembering? You understand? He said he put it there where he would remember, right? He would remember. But I don't really understand that to be him remembering. I believe it's for me to remember what he did for me, okay? 
So I, I think a lot of scripture sometimes reads one way, but I know in another place in the Bible it said that in, in chapter 11, I believe, in uh, Genesis, it said that man started creating for themselves, started creating, and they were going to build a, a temple, all, a tower all the way to heaven. And God said, let's go down because as one, nothing's impossible. They can do anything. Y'all remember that? But my Bible says, apart from God, you can do nothing. And we didn't even do all things. But he said, let's go down and confuse their language because they can do anything. Have you thought about it like that? So what I'm saying to you, when God talks, see, that's what hurts us sometimes in our earthly mind. When God talks to you, he's saying, we're talking in a worldly thing. They can do anything. He said, they can do anything because anything to them is doing what they want to do, spend their time building, creating, making what they think they need. But God says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So you're doing nothing to get back to me. You're doing nothing to get closer to me. You understand? So his, his language is, you're doing nothing to get you where you need to go. And you'll do everything to get away from it. Okay? And see, as, as you read the word, it starts showing you these things you've read through and you never thought about sometimes. The more you read it, I'm talking about, I'm in my hundred times some places, and it'll show me something that I, I can't believe I didn't see. I talked to Gary Harris probably as much about, y'all don't hold that against me, but, about, about stuff like this, because Gary, Gary is reading a lot, and sometimes he'll see things, he'll call me, you know, we talk about it, and he called me this week, Abraham was, is in my store today, and he, he was reading about Abraham, and I said, man, I just got, my sermon's written a little bit about Abraham, you know, in, in the book, and he was talking about this, so I said, same verse I read, you know? But today is an unbelievable day. I mean, it really is, every day's an unbelievable day, though. You know, that's the way we got to think, it ain't, Today's special because we set aside to remember, but I hope we set aside every day. I hope we remember every day the promise is everything he did. You know, it ain't just a one-time promise. You know, I was, I, was, I was just going through the Bible, and I saw where Balak sent some men to it. He was the king of Mo, the Moab tribe, and he sent some men over to get Balaam to curse God's people, to curse them. You know, and he sent them over and said, go get him and tell him to come back here come to our place and curse God's people. He said, well, y'all stay here tonight. Let me talk to God, and I'll get back with you and let you know. Well, the next day he comes back and tells him, I can't go. God says, not go. I ain't no way I can curse them. God's going to bless them. They're his people. He's going to bless them. So they go back and tell him he sends them back again. And he asks him the second time, come go with us again. What does he say? Let me confer with God. Y'all stay here tonight. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Well, God sends him the next time. And I always under try to understand why he tried to kill him next? They put a put him on a donkey, but I had a guy with a sword. The donkey could see him. A donkey spoke to him. Y'all remember the story? And, you know, okay. So what I was trying to understand: Why would he tell him to go? So he told him to go because he shouldn't have asked him a second time. He had no reason to ask him again. He done told him what he's supposed to do. But he went back because he's offering him so much, and he said, "Well, let me go make sure it's okay." God said, well, go. But seven times he asked him in the story about cursing them. And he, and he says, how can I curse them? God says, I, don't I have to do what God says? And God says he's going to bless them. Well, don't God tell us he's going to bless us every day if we'll do what we're supposed to? We, we, we struggle in areas because of a, maybe a little less faith, a weak faith, or not maybe where it needs to be, Okay. So God knows everywhere everybody's at. He knows right where you are. He knows in your life if you, your, your faith will grow by doing this or if it, it will hurt your faith or it will get weaker. He knows all that. He knows everything about you. And so when you're, when, you're, when you're sitting sometimes and you're going through things in life that are, are hard, I think about when Jesus was going through something hard. He said, if it's possible, take this away. Even the perfect Savior said that, but he didn't mean it like we did. He didn't mean to take it away. He said, if there's another way to bring these people to you, I'll do that too. I'll do whatever it takes, but your will be done. And in our lives sometimes, we only don't ask God, we do what we think's best. We don't include him in our story and what, what, we, what we're going through. And uh,
you know, as I was going through the Bible, there's just certain places when you read in some, it's a certain scripture that I just wanted to read this one thing that I that story about Balak. After he got through talking to him, he, he asked him a question. So he said, go back to Balak and give him these words. And he sent him back again to, I mean, Balaam. Balak. Balaam sent word back to Balak and said, then he spoke the message. Arise, Balak, and listen. Hear me, son of Zippor. God is not human that he should lie. Not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I have received a command to bless. He is blessed, and I cannot charge it. I mean, change it. I cannot change it. But just even then, he knew God. He knew when God told him that he's not a man. He ain't human. Why does he say that? Because we change our mind. Because we don't fulfill what we say we're going to do sometimes. So he compared himself to man. And man never adds up. And every, every single word here he said, does he promise and not fulfill? Has anybody ever made a promise that didn't fulfill? <laughs> Has anybody that hadn't ever done that? <laughs> you see, you see, and didn't we make a promise to him when he gave us his spirit? Okay. Don't take that lightly because he gave you himself. So when we tell people that everybody does that or everybody sins or it ain't that big a deal, it's a big deal to God. It's, it's not never a big deal. Anything that hinders your relationship and your conversation with him and your time with him, even your time, that's what we don't realize. It ain't about sometimes about how much you're reading. It's about how much your mind's on him, how much time are you spending in the mind with him, okay? Because he says what all the time. Pray what? Without ceasing. You know, how you pray without ceasing? I don't think he means close your eyes right down the road driving. I think he means think about me. Meditate on me. Know that I'm with you. Know that I've got you. Know that I've made a promise to you. He can, you can put your name there. You can't put your name there if I say it. Even I w would like to say you can, but you can't. I, I went and bought some dye to put in this lake. I bought it a week ago. I saw it in my truck floorboard yesterday when I was over at the farm. I said, man, I got to go put it in right now. I said, I'll do it after I get through plying. So I got on my truck and plied, plied, jumped the truck and went to the back road home, got home, looked at the floorboard. There's that die I bought, you know. So I come over here this morning and threw it in. It'll be ready to see it tomorrow. <laughs> but everything about me, you know, I had good intents. I meant, I meant to do it. But... It, you know, people say it's old age. I hope it is age, you know. I hope that's what's causing that problem, you know. But we got our mind on so many things we want to get done. And really, truly, sometimes when you're cutting your grass, you can think about God. When you're working in your yard, you can really think about him. When you're by yourself, you should think about him. The other people's normally the ones got you busy not thinking about him. You, you with me? Because... He's God. He never, never will forsake you, never leave you. He's always about you. That's what's unbelievable to me. He, he really cares. You know, we, as, as we go through things in, in, in the book of Joshua, in chapter 23, I'm going to read just a few verses for you. He was saying a farewell to the leaders. He was letting them know I'm fitting to leave this place. And he was preparing them for what was to come. You know, I, I sort of like me thinking about a wheel. You know, they said you don't really need to put. I did a wheel 15 years ago. Lots changed in 15 years. Well, I got some things. I want to try to put them where I think they need to be. They said, well, that's a completely different kind of wheel than a normal wheel. You got If you're going to try to tell what, who gets what, where they're going to go, and all that kind of stuff. I said, well, I need to. He said, why well, you think your family will fight over? I said, dang, I don't think they'll fight over nothing. But I want to leave no problem where they could. I don't want them to have to worry about who got this, who got that. I want to tell them what they need to get. Then they can do what they want to with it. You, you understand? It's just I want to do that. It's sort of like I felt like when I was reading this about Joshua, and he said, in verse, just in, I'm going to skip some verses. In verse 3, he said, You yourselves have seen it, everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you for your sake. He's done the things he's done in your life for your sake. You understand that? Everything he's done. To be very strong, be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or left. 
<laughs> you can go down the road and you can look to the right or left if you want to a little bit, and I do, and it's easy to run off the road. <laughs> just a little bit, just a quick little look sometimes, you know, and especially that phone, will it get you? I wish it never been invented just about it. That sounds crazy, I know. Verse 10, it says that one of you routes a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you just as he promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. He didn't say he routes five or ten. He said he routes a thousand. He don't work the way we work, does he? It's amazing. I mean, just In verse 14, he said, I am about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. Do we think he's failed today? You can look around at this world. I heard this day before yesterday. I just got to tell it. Uh, you know, the young people today are thinking we're getting dumber. They're getting smarter, I think. Or we're not quite as smart as we used to be. Y'all sort of think that way, watching things. Well, you know, back in the 60s, 70s, you get a, you could buy a vehicle, and in the manual, it put in there how to adjust the valves in the, in the motor. It, it put in there how to do that. Well, you know, that's pretty good, thinking the person that's got this vehicle got no sense to be able to do that, you know. So then I look, and in the manual today, they put in there, do not drink the contents of the battery. Now, you know, um, I don't think I ever thought about doing that when I was growing up. But they must be thinking about it today because that's what they put in the manual. You know what I'm talking about? So I'm wondering which one's got it right. It's unbelievable, ain't it? I mean, would you ever thought 30, 40, 50 years ago they had put don't drink the acid in the battery? It just, it's just... We're going, to, we're going, it looks like we're going the wrong way, okay? But we're going his way because he's allowing it to happen. We're the ones that's causing it to happen. Amen. He's allowing things to happen because of people, okay? Because we might need to go through this. And if not, we're going through it anyway. And you're going to learn what you're going to learn from it, okay? Anybody here ever tried to get a kid to eat something, a little kid to eat something that they didn't really want? Just think now, did you not eat it for them? Did you not put it in your mouth to show them? Did you not, even if it was bad, did you not make a face? <laughs> think about it now. You didn't go, you went, this show is good. Am I right? So, so when you're going through something bad, don't make the face. Because somebody's watching you. Let your face be knowing that God's got it. You can give joy in a bad situation. We deceive by the way we move our face. How's that look? Looks really good. <laughs> and the whole time you're thinking, I wouldn't put that on for nothing. You see how we, but we do that, okay? That's the way Satan comes. He comes the opposite. He comes to what you can accept, what you think. He's looking that way, okay? And uh, in First Chronicles 17, seventeen, verse twenty-three and twenty-four. He said, "Now, Lord, let the promise you have made concerning your servant." and his house be established forever. Do as you promised, so that it will be established, and that your name will be great forever. Then people will say, the Lord Almighty is God over Israel. Is, Israel, is Israel's God. And the house of your servant David will be established before you. So there's a reason we go through what we go through, because he's trying to establish something. He's trying to explain to somebody. He's trying to help somebody else. He's using you to bring glory to him by telling that person who he is. He gets all the glory. He's the one that we have to understand that did everything. We're just vessels he's using to move it around. You with me? 
Uh, in Nehemiah 9, 7 and 8, he said, You are the Lord God who chose Abram. Can't get no brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you, and you made a covenant with him to give him to his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pezzarites, Jebusites, and Gishites. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. Noah was a righteous man. There's people through the Bible, Abraham was a righteous man. God said, go. What did he do? He went. Everybody knows he went. How hard do we struggle going sometimes? You know, do we ask God twice sometimes? Do we ask him three times? Do we not like the answer he gives us the first time? You know, it wasn't that Jesus didn't like what he had to go through. Is it was he knew he had to go through something, and he knew he had to go through whatever God put on him. There's nothing wrong with asking God, is there another way? But I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. There's no place in here in Scripture anywhere I've found where he said, is there another way? A problem. But I see a big problem with asking God two or three times. In Matthew 1, 20 and 21, we'll read a little scripture to you now. It says, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people. There's a lot of people out in this world that need to be his people. Because he'll do his part. The question is, are we going to do ours? There's no if in God. It's all in us. In Galatians 3.14, says, He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. It's a promise. And we know God fulfills his promise. So it ain't no question to God. It's a question to us. How much of him you want? If you want more faith, what does he say? Pray for more faith. Second Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, is keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Every one of us should be able to say that. Everybody, he wrote this book to Timothy, the second letter to him, and said, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life. How does life get to another person? We know God gives life. We can't give life. But the word of life gets to him through us. He might see something, we know all that, and understand. But he's going to talk to somebody and ask somebody who he is. He's going to say, you have been noticing something different about you. I've been hearing some things people say about you. I've been this or that. Don't we hear that kind of stuff, you know? And, I mean, it travels fast. Bad news travels like dynamite, you know? We need to travel good for you. News like dynamite. Amen. Hebrews 12, 4, 1 and 2. It said, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Obedience to God is everything as a believer. Because if you're not obedient, you're putting a stumbling block in somebody else's life. So the obedience part is where rubber hits the road in your life. Even though you might still be God, you're backsliding, you're stumbling, all these things we say could be true. But obeying. And you won't have to be worried and thinking because normally when I'm struggling with God, it's because I got something I want to do. It's because I got something 
that ain't right quite right. That's when I'm struggling. In Hebrews 11, 8 to 10, says uh, by faith Abraham when called to go to a place where later he would later receive as an inheritance obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going we want directions where we going we want to know what's there when we get there we want to know why we're going by faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country he lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city and with foundations whose architect and builder is God. That ain't here. We're not supposed to look forward to this place. We're not supposed to be so condemned and caught up in it so bad that we can't even be heavily thinking at all. We're thinking of something here all the time. We've got to get our mindset on things above and not on things below. That's what we, that's what, that really is what I think hurts us more in our witness than anything. And when you got a bunch of stuff, it's hard. Because they occupy you. In Mark 8, the book of Mark is the only one that had this in it three times. Um, in 8, 9, and 10. In 8, 29, it says, but what about you? This is, this is, uh, Peter speaking about salvation. He said, well, who do you say I am? Okay, after Peter said it, he said, what about you? He asked, what do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. The time wasn't right. Because he tells us, he warns us to make sure we tell everybody, right? But he said, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must keep, be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. That's in that chapter. In verse 9, the next chapter over, in verse 30, it says, They left the place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching the disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will be killed, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. You see the difference in the last time and this time? This time it says they didn't understand. And then he goes over to the next chapter, chapter 10, verse 30, 32. It said they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will be condemned. They will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. You see how much stronger that message got each time he told him? That was back to back to back. Okay? Did they understand it? Now, see, sometimes we got to understand why they don't understand. Okay? If they knew you in the past and they see you in the present, Sometimes they understand better. If they never knew you, it's hard to understand. Okay? The disciples knew and wasn't afraid, but the ones following were afraid, they said. Because the disciples knew we got him. We're okay as long as we're with him. As long as he's with me, I got him. But don't let him get out of here and get over to the side like Peter did. What did he do? Denied him three times to a little girl. Okay? Because he wasn't with him. He's in us. He will never leave us. He will go with you. He's with you. He's, everything about our life needs to understand it's all about him, okay? The world needs to see this in us. It needs to know that he's real to us. He ain't just something we think about three or four times a year or ten times a year. He's something we think about every day of our life. And when we do that, people see something they want to talk about. A conversation comes up, and God will put someone in your life just who you need to hear from. I'm telling you. He'll give you a number to call or somebody will call you. And everybody in this room knows what I'm saying. It's a believer has had somebody call you right when you needed to call. And you've actually called somebody and said, man, I'm glad you called me today. I mean, this happens. It ain't a coincidence. 
It's God just trying to show you I'm, I'm, I'm about every little thing you're doing. Last two things I'm reading. Mark and Acts 2. This is Peter now coming at, right after they come out of Pentecost. They said they was drunk. Remember the story? Said it was it must be drunk. Something's wrong with them. I think this is the boldness we need to we need to have. It might be a little strong, but it's what Peter did. Verse 14, it said, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my, out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourself know, which God did through you among them. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Now, we talk about we ain't supposed to stand up and say something to people. If you was in that crowd... And he just read this to you. He's calling them out as hard as you can call somebody. You hung him. You killed him. He said, but God raised him from the dead. Amen. Feeling, freeing him from the agony of death because he was, it was impossible to, for death to keep its hold on him. It is impossible for death to keep its hold on you if God has got you. I saw the Lord always before me because he was at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Is your heart glad and your tongue rejoicing? My body will also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your holy one see decay. You have made known to me the path of life and you will fill me with joy in your presence. Joy comes in the morning, it says. Joy comes right now. Joy comes every time you let know the circumstances in your life are because of him. <clears throat> Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, but he was a prophet and knew and knew he was he but he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on the throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. And we're witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you have now see and hear. I, I, I mean, can't you see him up there telling me this? Because he was all into it. He, he, he rose from the dead. I just saw him. I just ate with him. I just touched him. You know, and, I mean, it's unbelievable. He walked, saw him get out of the boat. You remember? I mean, I can't fathom the excitement in him telling these people this. Y'all just don't understand. He is real. He's alive. We saw him. And it just, it says, exalted to the right hand of God as he received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And they did definitely believe he wasn't the Messiah. But a Messiah's coming now. He's still coming today for them. That's sad, ain't it? When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Now, can't you, don't you want people to ask you that? Don't you want someone to come to you and ask you, What do I need to do? Because they see something in you they want to. 
Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The promise is there. There's plenty of people. We, we had a baptism last week or the week before, and it's, it's every time you turn around lately, we've been having some. We went a long spell without any baptisms, and we're starting to see some. But I'm also starting to hear about my friends, some friends, that used to, the other people went to church with kids getting baptized and stuff. God is about, he's in the baptizing business. He's, he's wanting so bad to, to bring people to him and to change their lives. Terry read this last week, and uh, when he read it, I was thinking about it when I had it here. I, in chapter John 14, it's the last thing I'm reading. We threw, praise the Lord. John 14, 1. But I want you, I want you to all to just really, truly think about this, this, what it says to us. Jesus comes to his disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have not told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through, the, through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been with you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I and the Father are one and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing the work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the work themselves. On the evidence, you're the evidence. We're, we are the evidence that the work's being done. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will even do greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. God, God, is, God is just as real today as he was then. And he's bringing glory to himself through every one of us that will allow him to do that. You know, today is, a, is Easter Sunday, and it's a, it's a great day, and there's a lot of great things going on, I would imagine. But it was cool this morning. But it was a good cool. Amen. You know, when you look around and see this many people here, it's a good day. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for you. For your word. I thank you for each and every one, Lord, that paid such a price, Lord, that we could have this to read. Lord, people gave a lot, but Lord, you gave more. You gave it all. Lord, give us the ability to understand what giving it all means. Help us, Lord, to, to seek you first in your kingdom and all these other things be given to us. Lord, we love you so much. I pray for each and every family here represented today. I pray for ones that are traveling and be with family, wherever they're going. I pray for each and every church, Lord. I pray the truth would be spoken. Lord, when it's not spoken, I pray you reveal it. But, Lord, let people have a heart and desire to want to know the truth. Set them free from the bondage, even when they don't know they have it. Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you. We just pray now that you'll go with us as we enjoy the rest of this day. Thank you, Lord, and anything, Lord, for your son. And thank you for the whole story coming true. Lord, because you are a God that does not lie and can't. Thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.